Instagram. Hello, Facebook. I don't know which one of you to look at the most. Hang on. Facebook has my head chopped off there. That's better. How you guys doing? We are here in the gathering room. How you? Oh, gosh. I keep... Okay. My ongoing quest to make my language right. I'm going to say you all, not you guys. So who's here? We got 12 peoples here. How is it? Let's see. Let's see. I just have to... See. Oh, Kira's here and Samita and... 12 other people. Oh, 31 other people. Who? I'm Kareen. Hello. I, it's just you. She dials in from Lillehammer every week. It's incredible. Lindsay, hello. Tracy and Amy and Ellen and Flo and Monica and Sophia and everyone. It's so good to see you here. <sighs> How's your week been? It's been, it's finally gotten hot. Ooh, I'm sitting directly in front of a painting and it's growing out of my head. And I'm waiting for a hundred people to be here so that we can get to our discussion today. Audie's here and Jane and Devin and Monica and Mary James. Mary James? Yeah, Mary James. Cool. Is Instagram on? Instagram, hello. I pressed it. Uh-oh. Okay, I'm gonna let you fuss with that, Ro. Hang on. Boop. Okay, we may not have Instagram today. That's just too bad. Um, while I'm getting, while the great hand of God now <laughs> takes care of, of the Instagram issues that we're having, I want to welcome you to the mess that is my life. Okay, and I will tell you what is going on. I have been doing a lot of work on how to get into the most creative possible brain state. And part of this is because of the Practical Wayfinder uh, Creativity Mindset program we're running later on this summer. And part of it is because I just like doing this stuff. Also, um, Jill Bolte Taylor, whom I've mentioned many times uh, before, she's a Harvard neuroanatomist who had a stroke that took out the left half of her brain basically for about eight years, built back that part of her brain again, is now, you know, neurotypical, as we say, but had eight years of experience with only the right side of her brain really being dominant. And I've been reading her new book, which is amazing. It's called Whole Brain Living. She's going to be on. This show with, I, she's coming to the gathering room as a guest because that's so amazing. Anyway, she's done all this work on the way the right brain works versus the left hemisphere of the brain and how the creativity mindset is basically on the right hand side. And it's fascinating work and I've been using her methods and methods that I've read in other neurology things. And I've been getting into a very creative mindset, which is amazing. And it's not just about like painting pictures or singing songs. It's about building your life. It's about anything that you're creating, a party, a relationship, anything. But, and, and by the way, it also takes you out of fear unless you experience God. This is Jill's work and she's just flat out says it in this new book of hers. If you've seen her TED Talk, the most watched TED Talk in history um, about the stroke that she had, she talks about feeling this vastness and um, incredible peace and bliss when the left hand side of the left side of her brain was offline. So in this new book, Whole Brain Living, she talks about how fear and linear processing live on the left side of the brain and joy, but also a perception of the divine live on in the right hemisphere. And she just flat out says that whatever you want to call God, You'll find it by accessing your right hemisphere. So, yeah, I'm in this state of bliss a lot, folks, because I have been doing everything that she says and everything that I know how to do in other ways. And in my particular case, it does come out as drawing and painting. Now, usually the left side of my brain puts on the brakes when the creative right side gets too, like, dominant. But because I've been focusing on getting more and more into that brain state and because my family has been, I don't know whether to call it supporting or enabling me, it has gotten to some pretty ridiculous levels. Um, so this is me lately. I will be, I'll get up at three in the morning, seized by an idea for some visual effect that I have to create right away. 
by the time everybody else gets up, I'm dressed in like my pajamas, but then I've put an apron on sort of in case I get paint on it. But over that, I've put a sweatshirt because I'm cold, but I don't want to ruin my sweatshirt. So the sweatshirt is on inside out. And I've got like two different shoes, you know, a different set of shoes on each foot. And my back is hurting because I've been crouching on the bathroom floor painting because that's what you do, right? See, I started drawing and painting when I was a little kid. And so I never really reached the stand by the easel phase. <laughs> I just, I walk around the house carrying a large canvas and all my painting material. I don't have like a localized spot. And I used to make these painting nests. I also make writing nests when I'm writing a book or anything. I have to make a nest around me of like, papers and pencils and uh, cups and things. But my painting nests have become painting trails. I mean, it is, I had to clean it up today. The shame was just too much. I mean, it's trails of paintbrushes and rags that I've been using with turpentine on them and sketches and tons of drawing tools. You can kind of see behind me a bunch of sketchbooks and things because they've really been, they've been all over the house. Um, I tidied them up a little. So the right hand side of the brain in Jill multi Taylor's book, she talks about how the creative, um, there are three parts of the brain. The, the left side has two characters and the right side has two characters. And she said, she has, you give each of those characters a name. And she got to the creative part and she said, I knew she was going to ask, what do you want to name this creative character? And I thought, I'm going to name my character Pigpen after the, do you remember the little character in Peanuts who always trailed like all kinds of dirt and he was always covered with stuff. And I thought, I'm going to name my creative self Pigpen. And then Jill Bolte Taylor, what does she say her creative self is named? Pigpen. We're the same. <laughs> Jill and I have the same pig pen self. So I've been really, really making messes. My body is killing me because I will like stand for six hours in a very strange position to get the, the paintbrush to go the right angle. The other day I said to someone, um, you know, everything is just, creativity is all the rearranging of existing materials. Like they're all the literature in the English language is just the recombination of the same 24 letters. And then I was like, wait, how many letters are there in the alphabet? And she said, 26. And I was like, thank goodness Harvard already gave me my PhD before this happened. So um, I've been in a really happy, happy, happy space, very creative, um, but not exactly fit for polite society. Everything was fine though, because I'm doing this creativity course, so I have an excuse. I can make a living doing this, right? Until yesterday, when it was, it was the first day off that I had from other things, and I painted for like 12 straight hours, and I ruined the painting I was working on. <gasps> I could not sleep last night. I just lay there thinking, my painting is ruined. It's a dog's breakfast. This is an Australian saying that I love. It's like when every, anything is a complete and total mess, they say it's a complete dog's breakfast. And last night I just lay there going, I'm wasting my life on this. And all I do is make messes. And I thought about the messes I've made in relationships, the messes I've made in career, the messes of, I've just made messes everywhere. And I was really getting down on myself. And then at about, I don't know, six in the morning, I thought, I thought a thought. And the thought was the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy always increases. In other words, systems always move from more order to more disorder. And there's no way to create a new order without creating more disorder in the world in general. So for example, Michelangelo carved the David beautiful, like this incredible thing that has never, had never existed before. But you know what else he did? He left hundreds and hundreds of pounds of dust and rubble everywhere. I mean, he hacked off little bits of stone and he was always covered with dust and it would go up his nose. And then when he painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling, he actually, he wrote about how the skin in the front of his body got all stretched and saggy because he's always doing that. At least looking up at the ceiling to paint on these big scaffolds. And like he made messes, messes, messes to create these incredible artworks. Um, if you've ever done a Rubik's cube, you get to the end and it looks like, like just one tile you have left to put together. 
And to get the algorithm right, you have to make a mess of the, of the order you've created. You've got everything right but one. But to get that one fix, you have to mess it all up again, right? And then you can get the whole thing to come together. So here's what I wanted to tell you right now today. If there is ever a time when you decide you're going to build something beautiful out of your life, there will also come a time when you create a dog's breakfast out of everything. Like you will be in the middle of, I don't know, raising a child, decorating your house, uh, making a project for work, giving a presentation and there will be there will come a moment when you go oh my gosh i've ruined everything my life is is now a dog's breakfast and all this work that i've done and everything i thought i would have all the ambitions and dreams i had they're all completely tanked and there's nothing but just this scrambled heap of gunk to show for it that you guys that is the point where you're very close to moving into success. It's the point where your abilities meet their limit. And I had a hugely profound experience watching this guy, uh, a landscape painter who put some of his painting, he puts painting videos online, time-lapse photography of him painting these beautiful little landscapes. And he happens to be a photorealist. Like he makes paintings that are so precise that you actually can't quite tell them from the photographs he's working from, which, to me, kind of begs the question, why do them? But sorry, that's just me. Here's the thing, though. He has these incredibly beautiful, precise paintings. And the first time I watched him paint, he got started. And about five minutes in, I was like, that's terrible. That is a dog's breakfast. You've made a horrible painting. And then he said, now watch this. And he started doing a few little adjustments little I mean little and it went from the dog's breakfast stage to absolutely perfectly immaculate with just a few extra touches of his brush and I thought that this morning I was like okay I'm right at I'm at that point on the curve if I can just hold it together and keep patiently working toward the vision I see in my mind I'll be able to bring it out of the dog's breakfast stage and so, yeah, that's what I've been doing up till now today. But I've been thinking as I paint about all the other parts of my life that I feel bad about because I've, I'm at the dog's breakfast stage. And if I just hold a vision and keep practicing, you may have heard me talking about deep or dedicated practicing where you hold an image of what you want in your mind and then you push yourself technically to create that particular effect and to get it the way you see it in your mind and keep your imagination like it's that Dante thing where at the end of the Divine Comedy he says imagine something beautiful now imagine it even more beautiful now imagine it even more beautiful now hold that steadfast like a rock and you can create it you will create it so what I wanted to tell you guys today is wherever you are in creating any part of your lives if you're at the dog's breakfast stage congratulations do not give up now. This is the darkness right before the dawn. If you can keep pushing, and it won't be easy, but it will be absorbing, and it will take you out of fear, and it will take you into bliss, and it will make you make messes in your house, but it will also make you aware of the presence of the divine. So I think it's a pretty good bet. And it will always increase disorder in your life. Your life will always, you'll always be going toward ultimately the the gentle and slow exit, I hope for you, exit from this body, from this earth, from the order we have here into something that's more unlimited, which we access already by going into that creativity mindset. Okay, so I wanted to take any questions that you have about this. So um, Christina says, just keep swimming. And I love that phrase. Um, hang on. I'm going to the questions. Here we go. All right. So Laurie Swanson says, how is our cre creativity related to our intuition? It's interesting. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're really close to each other. Um, intuition, I think, has a little part of the left side of the brain where the fear circuits live because sometimes we get that prickle of fear. And that's why it's good to have that left side of the brain in operation so that if you're like drifting in a sea of bliss on the right hand side something's there to go wait wait there may be something not perfect here 
So we need to be aware of little hunches and feelings. But the thing is, when we're in very linear thinking, very culturally biased thinking, we don't notice the intuition coming from either side of the brain. So when we let go and relax, which you have to do to enter this creativity mindset, um, you're also more aware of information coming from every part of the brain. And those add up to intuition. I think intuition is this massive machine that works on a whole bunch of different circuits all at once, including some that you might well call psychic. I mean, we've had those experiences, right? I have, you have, why do we keep it a secret? Okay, Amy says, how do you stay sane in the dog's breakfast stage? You throw things at the wall, you have tantrums, you, you call your loved ones and say, I have ruined everything. And um, you express what you're feeling. I mean, it's a very, uh, it's more like being an animal than being cultured. You get to express yourself. But if you've got to the dog's breakfast stage and you're recognizing that it's not perfect, it's because there is an image in there that is different. And this is what I did today. And please like try this experiment. If you think you've messed something up, I just thought I'm going to go sit in front of this painting that I've been working on for weeks. It's a large painting with a tiny brush. It's so annoying. Anyway, um, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to calmly assess what's working and what's not. And I'm going to see what needs to be done. And at three in the morning, I was like, I can't fix it. Because I was using a very particular type of oil painting where you use only transparent tape, a paint. And it's like watercolor. If you mess up, you have to start over. And I thought, nah, I'm just, I, I, I can add white to my palette and start painting more like an ordinary oil painter. And so I'm, here's what I'm going to do. And I just sat in front of the painting and thought, okay, this, this 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 and then I got other people that I trust and I said okay what's working what's not and I just methodically set about fixing it so when you get to the dog's breakfast stage like in a, your relationship let's say you're parenting a teenager and it's not going well sit down with an advisor sit down with your co-parent sit down with the kid and say this is not quite working it's promising and I can feel something wonderful trying to happen but it's clearly not working. So let's talk about what could work better. And that kind of honesty, the willingness to say that it's a dog's breakfast and that's okay, that's everything. That get, gets rid of ego and allows you to turn this creativity process into something that does create disorder, but then creates these new and beautiful orders um, as a result. So yeah, that's what you do. You get humble, you get open, you expose yourself to negative feedback, and then you get to work. You make it right. Okay. Um, he prefers stars. says, how do you know the difference between being in the dog's breakfast stage or just not quite being on the right track? The anxiety of being out of integrity versus the intensity disorder of creativity. Wow, you nailed it. That is exactly right. And I would not have thought of that. So thank you for providing the answer to your own question. Um, when you're not making something that's right for you, it doesn't compel you. It doesn't, you don't even care if you're at the dog's breakfast stage or not. You're like, eh. Because if you're, it's only when you're in full integrity that that creativity, I think because I'd been so focused on creativity, what happened, you know, after, as I was writing the, the way of integrity and all that stuff, and as I talk about it on podcasts and interviews, the more you get in integrity, which is alignment with all your meaning making systems. So all your body, your heart, your mind, and your soul are telling the same story. What happens is that miracles start to occur around you and the creative force of the universe starts to flow through you at, a, at more velocity than ever before. So if you happen to be somebody who uses your creativity um, to go out and, and track animals in the forest, you're going to want to do it more when you're in integrity. If your creative side likes to play music, you're going to have new ideas for music or new ideas for getting better at music if you're in integrity. If your creativity is mathematics, you're going to have more ideas when you're in integrity. So yeah, absolutely. The anxiety of not being on the right track is boredom and ugh. the 
frustration of deep practice is that you can imagine something so beautiful you cannot stop yourself from wanting to create it, but you're not quite technically there. And it just, it pushes you and it keeps you in the, the learning stage that young children are in, something called the rage to master, which is so cool. And they see this in kids who are prodigies, but you also see it in, in little babies. Our little baby is trying to like, she's trying to get mobile and you see her just it's like she has to get moving but she doesn't quite know how I still feel that and I'm like a million years old and hey it means that you're always learning and playing like a kid so it's not so bad Sarah says how do I loosen up my perfectionist tendencies with creative tasks reading your books your book a second time oh you're so kind thank you okay hmm the perfectionist lives on the left side of your brain it is the ta- it is, does things in linear order and it wants them done right and it would rather not do anything at all than do something incorrectly and our culture so this is where the integrity piece comes in because the the thing that drives us out of our integrity out of our true nature is our culture and our culture happens to be obsessed with the things that happen on the left side of the brain so linear order analysis processing fear, anxiety, shoring things up against mistakes, shame, all this, all this stuff, it keeps us able to live together, but it's so overemphasized in our culture. Um, Jill was telling me that I said, what happens to people who have a stroke on the right side of the brain? So that goes offline. And she said, oh, they're completely miserable. They're obsessive. They're perfectionistic. They're self-loathing. They're afraid of everything. She said, it's just, it's a nightmare. And so we have to bring the right side of the brain back on just to give them some relief. But if it's all balanced, oh, and she was telling me 10 times as many strokes happen in America on the left side of the brain as happen on the right side of the brain. So either we're overusing the left side and blowing out the circuits or some benevolent force is taking us offline in that left hemisphere so that we can enter the creativity part of the brain and the the connected to God part of the brain. So it has to balance. So if your perfectionism is getting in the way, um, I won't just keep saying what Jill says to do, but read her brain, read her book, Whole Brain Living. What she says to do is just go to the part of yourself that is compassion, because that's on the right side of the brain and embrace the perfectionist with love. So I do this all the time. Like I, I, that's how I got through the night last night. I got my perfectionist self all in a lather about how I'd ruined everything and I, I had messed up this painting and wasted all people's time. And then I said, but it's okay, honey. And I, I went to the part of me that is a mom, that is a partner, that is a coach. And I just tried to extend to that perfectionist side of myself the compassion that I would extend to anybody who was in the room with me and was feeling bad and so that you love the perfectionist and I always like to say I'm still a perfectionist but I just don't care anymore so it's when the compassionate side comes in when pig pen comes in and gives that rule oriented perfectionist a hug that perfectionist maintains her intensity but I've also got someone in me, pig pan, who's just happy and messy and loving and it balances everything out and it's lovely. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I just got a, a message from someone saying, by the way, all of this is going to be in the course that we're doing. So sign up for the course, um, Practical Wayfinding, which is totally different. We did we do it occasionally, but it's always all new content. And this coming few months, it's going to be the creativity mindset. So come on over and hang with us and we'll teach you all kinds of hacks for getting into the creative divine part of the brain. Okay, Jessica says, when I have to stay diligent with providing... How can I engage creative ideas that feel sort of high without exhausting myself and feeling dread toward daily work? I use the creative work as a reward and I'm not always good about stuffing the creative work and doing the drudgery stuff, but I'm pretty good about rewarding myself for drudgery by giving myself creative 
like fun time. And it's very important that you keep it fun and not do it to like, you don't want to subordinate your creativity to capitalism. Like, yes, I'd, I'd love to do this, but maybe I can sell it. Maybe I can be a singer or a, I don't know, a marionette, professional marionette performer or something. That tends to kill the creative impulse. So don't subordinate it. Just do it for its own sweet sake. And it puts energy back into the system so that you can use it to do things that are more drudgery. One of the things that really will put you in the right side of your brain is to laugh. And I've noticed when I work with my team, and we have to do a lot of things that are kind of drudgy, you know, things that have to do with building um, learning management systems on computers and so on. And um, we laugh a lot. There's a lot of silliness. And because of that, even the drudgiest parts, we can like email and text each other and go, I can't believe I have to do this and then tell jokes and bringing that in, bring the creative part into the drudgery, that can also be incredibly nourishing. And it's another benefit of being able to lock into this creative mindset, like having methods for doing that. So come and learn how. Okay. So Jody says, do you have to have that dog's breakfast? This amounts to nothing moment when you're writing books or creating a course. Yes, only always, I like to say. Every now and again, I'll do something that just goes slick as a whistle from start to finish. Uh, yeah, that happened, I think, once in my 40s. Um, hasn't been around lately. I, seriously, if I'm pushing myself, there's always a dog's breakfast. Fortunately, I've, I have two dogs and they love breakfast, so just feed it to them and all is well. Yeah, it's a good sign when you get to the point where you're like, this is a mess, but I, I see the vision. That's a good feeling. Learn to love it and learn to push through it. Um, that's not a good way to put it. Learn to create through it. Uh, yes, I am. Sam, I am says, I wonder if when we're creative, we shift out of the confines of self. So we access other selves and worlds. That's how it feels to me. Absolutely. Um, According to the austere version, uh, interpretation of, of quantum mechanics, which I think is the most credible to me, we are all basically one waveform. Um, the universe is all just energy. Um, even matter is just energy. And it's all responding to the same uh, vibrations, the same frequencies. And Jill Bolte Taylor talks about when her left brain was completely off, she knew herself to be as expansive as the universe. That version of quantum mechanics also says that there are many universes. So you would have to have other selves, other worlds, other universes if you're going to keep the whole shebang. And consciousness is not limited to anything so far as we know. So why not? And I do think that you can start to, it is as if you can be other people, uh, be other creatures, be entire huge numbers of creatures. There is infinite freedom in that creative mindset. And it's just, it's something I want everybody to experience. Dan says, what to do when there is too much joy? Sometimes the high energy can feel a little overwhelming, I guess. I'm talking about a job, love it, but I'm also looking for balance and it feels like I'm buzzed. Yeah, I actually have had that issue as well. And the, the, what I've noticed is I only get manic when the left side of the brain starts saying, yes, but what are you gonna do about it? And it's time to stop now. And really, shouldn't it be finished by now? Like thoughts start coming in and then the, the right side wants to push back and like and I start to get really hyper and buzzed and the way I come down from it is to go in deeper into the right side and say nothing happens out of order there is no need to push anything don't push the river it runs by itself right and I meditate and I calm myself because that high agitation is actually coming from the anxiety part of the brain mania comes from anxiety in my experience. And the bliss of creation takes you into a slower sort of alpha wave brain state that is actually very, very peaceful. So good catch there, Dan, and, and good luck fixing it up. Carolyn says, a quote I read yesterday, nobody tells you this, but getting into alignment with your inner being can sometimes feel like baptizing a cat. <laughs> Reminds me of another quote uh, from Mark Twain. 
which is, and Jill quotes it, which is, um, there are things you can learn from carrying a cat by the tail that you can learn in no other way. So you just kind of, it's, yes, it's joyful and it's hilarious and you make messes. Cats baptized, dogs breakfast, it gets wild and very furry up in here. Finally, May says, how does one continue in the creativity right brain dominant flow when one continually gets interrupted by real life demands like baby diapers and cries for mama, work and relationship demands, etc.? Well, one of the things that I've done in my life is to bring other people into it. Um, I made my creativity my life, uh, my job as a coach, the books that I write, the, the articles, even the way I taught when I was a professor, they all came from that creative part of my brain. And as far as parenting demands went, um, I found that my children were very, very interested in the right side of their own brains. And so like they all grew up to be really interested in story, in design. Um, there, two of them are brilliant artists. Um, one sat down at last Thanksgiving and while talking to everybody in the room wrote a novel, a pretty good one, a really good one actually, short novel. Um, they became very creative people because I couldn't get out of my, the right side of my brain and be happy. So I just brought them into it. And now um, we all just, sit around making pictures and showing each other and it's pretty amazing so yeah you guys life is a creative project there is a part of you that's waiting to be set free that is a creator that is in touch with the creator big capital c that will give you tremendous joy and that will make all kinds of dogs breakfasts and that's just the sign that you're about to break through to a whole new level of joy in your life so mwah, mwah, mwah. Come and sign up for our creativity thing. And um, I love you very much. And I'll be back here. And I hope you will be too next week on The Gathering Room. Mwah, 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 mwah. Now I have to turn this off.